tiny part about one tiny corner of, of what he talked about. And um, I, want you, I want everything that I say to be understandable. So I want you to interrupt me and stop me if something is unclear and elaborate. I, don't ha I have five lectures. I don't have to get through a lot. So we just have a discussion for 90 minutes. That's also OK. Um, so please stop me. And also, uh, um, I think I'm speaking loud enough you can hear me in the back, right? I'm not writing big enough so you can read it in the back, but I will try from now on to write big enough so you can read it in the back. Um, so really, I have five lectures, OK? At least that's the plan. With lecture five, it's still a little bit open-ended to see how far we get. So in the first lecture, I'll call it, um, it's entitled Harmony, since you won't be able to read it in the back, OK? Um, and that's really all about how to define a logic. How do we define a logic? Um, and this work in the first lecture goes back to um, Gensen's work in 35 that Bob already mentioned. Michael Dummett had a very influential series of lectures and paper in 1976. And Martin Leff had a very influential paper, paper in 83. So it's really about those three papers that the first lecture is about. Um, then in the second lecture, um, which is entitled Proofs as Programs, I will talk again about a small corner of the big picture that Bob drew. And um, we'll talk about how to compute in logic. So we go from pure logic of reasoning, which will be the first lecture, to actual computation and the connection to programming languages. Then in the third lecture, we'll talk about the sequence calculus, which also was invented by Gensen for, for a very specific purpose. He wanted not to only define logic, which he actually did, with inference rules, which are natural deduction, but he also developed techniques for reasoning about the logic. Okay, not reasoning within, but proving properties of the logic. And for that purpose, he introduced the sequence calculus, which is also very important from the computation perspective. It's also very important to understand properties of logical systems. So I would say, this, the, would say the first three lectures are sort of the core of what I'm trying to get across. Um, and then we'll come to um, two more topics, which are more my current uh, area of research, but I think you'll also find it interesting. So the fourth lecture will be on linear logic, and the subtitle of that truth is ephemeral. Okay, So it's a very uh, um, unusual point of view of logic, which Jabbar introduced in 86. And then we'll talk about the computation and interpretation of linear logic. And here, rather than proofs as programs, you could have still said that, but here the interpretation is proofs as processes. So if you want to get a good logical handle on understanding concurrent computation, then you need linear logic, and I'll lay out how that works. Okay. Um, but the lectures four and five, we'll see how far we get. Um, and I'm willing to go as slow as necessary and cut material if, if needed. Okay. So, um, so let's start at the beginning. So what is logic actually? Okay, what do we study in logic? So let me put it here. So logic is a study, the laws governing valid inference. OK, and the emphasis here is on inference. So we often say, oh, this is true and that is true. But in some sense, we are not really concerned in logic about what is true and what's not true. You might say that's philosophy in general. What we're really interested in is when you can infer something from something you already know, or when you're allowed to conclude something. So how do you do inferences in a valid way? That's what we study in logic. Okay, so I'll give you an example. Okay, so, uh, so again, this goes back to a famous uh, sort of logical puzzles, okay. So um, we'll have one sentence. Okay, is this readable in the back? Doing okay? Okay, so Helen is a woman. Okay, that's my first statement. I'm talking about Helen of Troy, okay. And the second one is all women are mortal. Okay, and you could probably supply the third line. 
Okay. Therefore, okay, Helen is mortal. Okay, so one thing we can ask here is whether the deduction from these two lines to that point to that third line is a valid deduction. But we're still talking about very concrete sentences. We're talking about Helen of Troy, we're talking about mortality, and so on. That's not really what logic is about. If we talk about this in logic, we'll first abstract over this, we write it in a formal language, and we reason within that formal language. Okay, so the first step would be something like, okay, we introduce a predicate. So for example, saying Helen is a woman, okay. Then all women are mortal, I would say something like, for every x, if x is a woman, that implies that um, x is mortal. And then here I would con conclude that mortal of Helen. Okay, so now at this point I've really translated these informal linguistic statements in natural language into some kind of a formal language, but I haven't really reached logic yet in some sense because this still talks about Helen of Troy. I have introduced some logical symbols, but I'm still talking about very concrete objects. So what I really study in logic is the, quest is the following question. If I have some kind of a proposition here, P of some constant C, so I abstract away from being a woman and the constant C. And here I say that for every x, um, if P of x implies Q of x, can I conclude that Q holds off the constant C? Okay, so when we actually talk about reasoning, when I talk to you about how to define the logic, we don't talk about this thing, we don't talk about this thing, but what we really talk about is at this level of abstraction, where P and Q are arbitrary propositions, X is some quantified variable, C is some kind of a constant that we can talk about in our propositions, okay? Does that make sense? Is there any question about this? Okay, so but in logic we can ask if that deduction from these two, when we draw a line between this, if you know this and we know that, can we conclude that? Okay, and then this might be a concrete interpretation of that with some specific predicates, and there might be just a, a natural language sort of rendering of the same argument. So we're asking if that proposition, that in, uh, form of reasoning here is valid. Okay, does it make sense? Okay, so the, the next question is, why am I going through a lot of trouble to actually spend a whole lecture on talking to you about how to define a logic? So um, some model is that, well, 1935, or maybe in the ancient Greek time, somebody defined logic. So we know what logic is. We don't have to define it anymore. We're done, OK? But that's actually not the case, because there's many, many different logics that people actually consider. And it's really important for computer science to consider the different logics. And here's why, OK? Um, Okay, so the reason is because on the logical side, different logics cover different modalities of truth, okay? And we formulate this, and well, I'll explain a little bit later in the lecture with the notion of a judgment. So we have some kind of a judgment here. Okay, so the, the basic judgment that we're talking about is that some proposition A is true. Okay, so for example, instead of writing just P of C, if we're being particular, we would say if P of C is true, and it's true that this implies that, can we conclude that Q of C is true? And then these things become proposition, and we're talking about whether propositions are true. If you just do that, okay, so this usually corresponds to, um, let me write it in the middle here. Um, we get something called intuitionistic logic. Intuitionistic logic. And we know, so this is logic, and we know that computationally, what does it correspond? Intuitionistic logic corresponds to a 
I think Bob mentioned in his lecture, but it's pretty, pretty obvious. Lambda calculus, right? Or if you want to put another term, more generic term on it, functional programming. Okay, so intuitionistic logic corresponds to functional program, which we'll see in the second lecture. Okay, now we could consider different judgment as well. We could consider A is true and A is false. And if we do that in a certain way, that gives us classical logic. And then there's a question here where there is a valid computational interpretation of that. Okay, um, so I don't want to spend time discussing that. But there's many other judgments we could make. For example, we could make a judgment that A is valid. Okay. So what does validity of A mean? Uh, validity of A means that the uh, proposition is true no matter what. Okay. Um, so the truth of a proposition usually may be contingent upon the world that we are in. For example, it's true that right now I'm holding this marker. When once I put it down, of course, it's no longer true which we'll come to in lecture four because truth is ephemeral, okay? Validity is not ephemeral, okay? Once something is valid, it's supposed to be true under every, every possible interpretation. And if we do that, then we get something called modal logic. And there's a whole bunch of different computational interpretations of modal logic. For example, it can refer to stage computation. It could refer to runtime cogeneration, um, and so on. So there's many different ways of interpreting that. And there's more here. Um, I'd say, I'm going to ask you for homework to do that, um, to define the judgment A is true at time t and the propositions that go along with that. Um, and so this is going to correspond to something called temporal logic. That's not surprising. And I'm not going to give away this, okay? Because hopefully, after three lectures, you can arrive where that should be, okay? So there's a computation interpretation of temporal logic, and it's pretty interesting, okay? Um, okay, or we can have A is true in world W. That gives us another form of modal logic. And so here we could have, for example, distributed computation. So the world W is where something is being computed. And the laws, presumably, of logic tell you how to plug these things together in the correct way. And so you get a model of you know, distributed computation. And then in the lecture four, we'll talk about A is ephemeral, so it's true, but only sort of in a certain, at, at the current point, if you want, or in a certain world, um, but abstracting away from the world is, and if you do that the right way, we get linear logic, and then if you do that, we get concurrent computation. So all these logic have been considered before. They don't originate in computer science. Okay? They originate in logic and philosophy because people were trying to capture different phenomena. Um, for example, the fact that true isn't always the same. It's different in different worlds. Or the truth might change with time. Um, and now we can apply these ideas, however, to computer science and see what are the computational consequences of taking that point of view. Now, in order to be able to play this out in the right way, we need to understand what are the basic principles that guide how we define the logic so we do it the right way. Because if you look at the literature and you look at all of these, you'll find it's not directly useful to computer science. The basic ideas aren't, but the particular way that they define the logical systems and the way that they think about, about these logics doesn't really help that much. Um, so we really need to go back to the basics and figure out how do we define the logic and then once you figure out what kind of logic we want to describe, we use these internal laws um, and how to define a logic. Then it's obvious well, after this lecture, I hope, how to define temporal logic. And then you can look at it and see, well, how do we compute? What is our computational mechanism that corresponds to temporal logic? 
and you get some interesting new programming language that you didn't think about before. Okay, so that's what this what uh, that's why it's so worthwhile spending a lot of effort on defining logics. Yeah. Okay, so A false would be, um, how would you find the, tr the truth of not A? When is not A true? Okay, so in intuitionistic logic, there's one way to define it, but there's another way to define it, which you can say not A is true if A is false. So you mean that classical logic can be encoded in intuitionistic logic? Um, well, that's also true, but that's what I was getting at. What I was getting at, if I follow the prescription of how to define logics that I'm going to lay out today, okay, then it's difficult to find classical logic, okay, because um, you will see that it sort of inevitably end up with intuitionistic logic. And so you can ask, well, what's missing? Why not classical logic? Right? Why don't you get out classical logic? And the answer to that is that you need a second judgment, which is that, that A is false. Okay, and we define truth and falsehood at the same time in a symmetric way. And if you do that, then you get classical logic. Okay? I don't know if that helps, but maybe at the end of the lecture it might be more clear. Okay. Okay. Yeah? Computation here is not necessarily determination. Um, okay, so... Okay, so if you take a purely logical point of view, so if you start with a pure logical system, computation will always terminate. And equations will be a consequence of computation, but they're not the first thing. So if you think about that triangle there, if you, if you look at the categorical side, the equations are paramount. On the proof theory side, the equations are not the first thing that comes to mind, but it turns out that there's a natural notion of computation that arises from the proof theoretic study of the meaning of propositions. And then you can use that in order to define how to compute. Okay. So, yes. So then if you want non-terminating computations, then you have to think about how to accommodate that. That's a separate topic. Yeah? Are there corresponding structures or uh, ideas uh, in category theory that kind of relate to each of these judgments? Yes, there are. Um, I'm not sure that all of them have been looked at you know, equally carefully. Um, certainly, there's categorical structures here, 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 and here. Um, I'm not sure completely about the temporal part if people have looked at that. Yes. So the triangle holds, okay, as far as we know, okay. Okay, so let's dive in, okay. Okay, so. Um, well, I'll put this. I'll put this over here because, okay. Okay, so the, um, the big question is what, is what determines the meaning of a proposition? Okay, so there's basically, um, there's many ways you could define that, but I think in principle there's two different ways that people have tried to define that. So one is what you call the Tarskian way, which is you describe the notion of a model and then you talk about the interpretations of the formulas in this model, okay? And that requires that you already understand the structure of models and mathematics. You want to use logic as a foundation for mathematics, that's kind of a circular thing because the models have already to be there before you actually even talk about them, okay? So there's another way which is taking the proofs as a primary thing, okay? And sometimes it's described as a proof theoretic semantics. And what Martin Leff says, okay, so this is Martin Leff, not, mach not machine learning, okay, and, and not ML as a programming language, okay. All right. Um, so the meaning of a proposition. is determined by 
what counts as a verification of it. And for the purpose of today's lecture, okay, instead of verification, let's just substitute the word proof. Um, in the second, in the third lecture, maybe, I can talk to you about the difference between the two, between verification and proof. I don't think I have time to talk to you about it today. So just think about it for now. The meaning of a proposition is determined by what's count as a proof of the proposition. Okay? So, for example, if I want to define you um, when a conjunction is true, okay, so this is, so when is A and B true? By the way, if I write this, I never write parentheses, but this true applies to everything that's in front of it. Okay? And when I write conjunction between A and B, I assume that conjunction is a constructor for propositions out of propositions. So that this whole thing here is a proposition, and this is a judgment about the proposition. And we see over there, there are other judgment today, only truth, okay, to make things simple. Okay, so when is A and B true? The way I'm gonna define that is I'm gonna say that, okay, it's gonna be like that. And I'm gonna name the inference rule and I call it ant introduction, okay, following, following Genson, okay. So I'm not gonna write this just as an inference rules, but I want you to view this as a definition of what conjunction is. Okay, do you understand the difference? Okay, in one point of view it is, oh, well, if A is true and B is true, then the conjunction must be true. Okay, I'm actually looking at it differently. For A and B, A and B to be true, okay, there must be some evidence that A is true and some evidence that B is true. So I'm thinking as this defines conjunction. Okay, so this point of view is sometimes called the verificationist point of view. Um, of the meaning of the connectors. Okay, any objection or discussion points on that? Okay. Okay, so the question now is, what do I do with that, now that I know the meaning of conjunction, okay? So the next question you ask is, well, if I know that A and B is true, what am I allowed to conclude from that? Okay, if I know a conjunction, what do I know if I have that? Any suggestion of what I might be able to conclude from that? A should be true. Okay, and this is called the first elimination rule. Okay, but I also can conclude B, right? So if A and B is true, then B is true. And this is the and, second and elimination. Okay, and I justify this, okay, from our principle if this is a definition of conjunction, then if A and B is true, then A must be true. Okay, so that one. And if A and B is true, then B must be true because it's our definition of conjunction to give me this rule. Okay, does it make sense? Yeah? No, that was my definition. Okay. And this is the consequence of the definition. Yeah? Okay, that's the name of the inference rule. And so the and is the connective, and. And I means introduction, because I'm introducing in the conclusion the conjunction. Um, this means and, E, E means elimination. That's because from the premise I eliminate the connectives in the conclusion. Okay, so this is the, these are the two elimination rules. Okay, um, so that went pretty well. That seems reasonable. Um, we do have to ask um, if the introduction and elimination rule fits together. So I justified the elimination rule from the introduction rule. Um, but in general, that may not be quite enough. So we need to lay down some criteria to make sure that these rules actually fit together. And one reason that might be is to prevent argument. Okay. So there's another kind of person, not the verification, it's called the pragmatist. Okay, I'm not a pragmatist, okay, but there are such people around, okay. And they would say, that's crazy, define 
the meaning of a proposition should be defined by how you can use it. Okay, not by how you prove it, but how you can use it. Okay? And so the pragmatist would say, this thing is my definition of conjunction. I'm telling you, if you know A and B, you know A. If you know A and B, you, use, you know B. Okay? And then from those observations, you would justify this introduction rule. Okay? So the pragmatist would take the right point of view of the definition and the left point um, as being derived. The verificationist takes that as definition and then tries to derive these. We have harmony if the two views actually coincide, if they give you the same rules. Okay? So if the pragmatist and the verificationist can agree, okay, then we have harmony in our definition, and then we have a good logic. Okay? So now we need to lay down and figure out what are the criteria and the tests that we apply to make sure that these things really do fit together. Okay. Okay. You might think about that while I erase this. Okay. So what I want to make sure is that um, okay, so I'm a, I'm a verificationist, okay? So what I want to make sure is that the, the elimination rules don't mess up my interpretation, my definition, okay? So I want to make sure that indeed the elimination rules are derived rules, okay? So what I want to check is the following. So if I have inferred, so actually many times today, I'm just going to write A and B instead of A true and B true, okay? because we're just considering truth today, and uh, it makes me, means I have less to write. Okay. Okay, this is just a shorthand for this, for this thing thing with, with, with true, okay? So I want to know that no matter what elimination rules I apply, I don't get any new consequences. Okay, I don't derive anything new. That means that anything that I can derive by an elimination rule is already justified, okay? So for example, if you have an arbitrary proof of A and B, and I'm going to denote the proof here with D and E, okay, I name the proof, so there's some proof of A up here, some proof of B up here, you get A and B out by using the introduction rule. Now I need to check if I apply some elimination rule to it, I don't gain any information. Okay, that means the elimination rules are justified because I don't get anything new out. So let's try the first one, and I get A, okay. The question is, how is A justified? By D, right? So A is already justified, so applying the elimination rule doesn't give me anything new that would mess up my interpretation of conjunction. Okay, so this, this property, if all the elimination, if all the introductions followed by all the eliminations for a connective, don't gain any information, we call that soundness, because as a verificationist, I think the elimination rules are sound. Okay, so this, I, I usually I say local soundness, because um, I'm looking at just an introduction right away followed by an elimination. In lecture three, we'll talk about more global properties. But today, you can forget about the local. And it's sound of what? The elimination rules are sound because they can be justified. And they can be justified because I already have evidence for A, which is this. And we call this a reduction, a local reduction. Because I assemble evidence for the conclusion uh, from somewhere that I already have, okay? So the local reduction in this particular case tells us that there's already evidence for A, so this rule is sound, yeah? No, actually, uh, I explained it as a negative, but I'm actually proving it very positively because I say there's already evidence, so I have to exhibit something concretely, which is evidence for the conclusion. Okay, so it's not a negative; it's actually directly exhibiting. Okay, how to get this direct evidence for A? But in case of, is this rule more complex? You have to apply them in all kinds of ways to make sure that you don't have a 
it gets more complicated, yeah? In the next half hour, we'll see more complicated things, but yeah. Yep. Yes. Yes, I just want to avoid, so if I'm be, I just want to avoid writing that. Because today we only have one judgment, so I'll try to make life easy for myself. Yeah? Is that, I mean, I guess I'm so confused with the and the C1. Is that a different and than the and that we're doing? And, and why, why do you use the same and in both places? This and is just a name for the inference rule. I could write out the word and, but it's easier to, un to remember the, the connection between the connective and the name of the rule if I use the same symbol. No, 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 not at all. It's a name for this inference rules. It's not a logical connective at all. I just want to name my inference rules so I can talk about them. Okay? Um, is that enough? This particular case, is that enough to show local soundness of the elimination rules? No, what else do I have to check? Right, if I take and E2, and what do I reduce it to? E. e, right. So I'm okay in both counts, right? So I'm not going to have to write it down, but the elimination rules are sound with respect to my definition of the introduction rule, right? Okay, everybody believe conjunction is okay? Okay, now there's a second thing I need to apply, I need to check. This is more subtle, okay? Um, so let's say, for the sake of argument, I was sloppy, Okay, just for the sake of argument. Okay, and I forgot the second elimination rule and elimination two. Let's see, I forgot that. Okay, now will the soundness test succeed or not? It will because I have just fewer things to check, right? Now, is there something fishy about the inference rules? If I forget the second elimination rule. What exactly is fishy about them? Yeah, you can't deduce everything you should be able to deduce from the conjunction because you put in a proof of A with the introduction rule, you can't get it back out, right? Um, so there would be something wrong. And in particular, the pragmatist would not believe my introduction rule at all, right? Because I said, pragmatist takes the one elimination rule as, its defini as his definition of conjunction he said, well, wait, that doesn't make any sense, okay? So what other tests do I need to apply to make sure um, that the system stays in balance? Any thoughts? Well, completeness, yes. Obviously completeness, right? If I check soundness, the next thing has to be completeness, right? All right. And obviously also it has to be a local completeness. And again, it's completeness of the elimination rules. I have enough of the, of the elimination rules. How do I test that? How do I test that I have enough elimination rules? Okay. Right, so probably not everybody heard this, but the suggestion was somehow we can deduce A and B by an introduction rule, okay, by applying the elimination rules. So let's see if we can make that more formal, okay. What I want to do is I'm going to, is there some way to apply the elimination rules to an arbitrary proof of A and B? So I start with an arbitrary proof of A and B. A and B is true. And I want to apply the elimination rules so that I can then prove A and B by its introduction rule. Okay, that means I can get the pieces out to reconstitute the proof of A and B, right? If I can get all the pieces out, enough pieces out, then I'm not losing information. So can I do that? How, what can I do in order to get, extract the pieces from A and B to get A? Can you go after proof A? Um, no, you don't want to go, well, uh, yeah. Right, okay. If I look at the introduction rule and I go up, it gives me a clue as to whether I have enough elimination rules. 
Okay, so you're trying to say, can I invert the introduction rule? Yeah. Right? Can I write it the other way around? Okay. So that'll work for a while, but that'll eventually fail. Okay. And the reason it eventually failed, that not all, in, not all introduction rules, turns out, will be invertible. Okay. And the example, I'll put it over here, will be, how do we define disjunction? Okay. We define disjunction saying A or B is true if A is true. And we have a second rule that says A or B is true if B is true. Okay. And then I can invert these rules. Okay. So in this case, that would work perfectly. Okay. But it won't work in general. Yeah? We need some way of copying. We need some way of copying. Right. Okay. So, so you want. We take a proof D of A and B, and we apply the elimination rule to get A out. Then we'll take a second copy of the proof, and we apply the second elimination, and we get B out. And then we reintroduce the proof of A and B. Okay? But there is some temporal aspect or some aspect here that I should make explicit is that what we started with so this was the local reduction to get us DA. I started with an arbitrary proof of A and B. And I wanted to show that there's some way to extract the components. In this case, I need to extract two pieces. So I need two copies. Okay. So in ordinary logic, if you know something is true, you can use that as often as you want. So it's okay to use it twice. Okay. So it's okay to take that proof A and Prove D and extract A over here, extract B over here, and then reintroduce the conjunction. Okay? That means if we have an arbitrary proof of A and B, we can always construct one that ends up with the inter end introduction rule, which was our definition of what conjunction should mean. Okay? So if we can do that, then we say the rules are complete. Okay? And this is called a local expansion. Okay? Um, so this is a local expansion because the proof actually gets bigger, right? We start with a simple proof and we make a complicated one out of it to show that the elimination rules are strong enough, okay? So here, this means elimination rules are not too strong. This means the elimination rules are not too weak. And that means the introduction elimination rules are in harmony, okay? Yep? So what, what defines the minimum amount of complexity that this proof has to be? Like, how do you know that you don't need to apply your Oh, you might have to apply them again. Um, the, the important thing is that you don't use any other connectives because you want the meaning to all the connectives to be independent from each other. You don't want the, the definition of implication to depend on conjunction or disjunction to depend on falsehood or whatever. So you can't use any other connectives. So if you have a conjunction, right, basically the only thing you can do, what we know so far, is apply the elimination rule. Right? It might be complicated. Okay, and sometimes it does get somewhat complicated. Um, but it is mitigated by the fact that we can't arbitrarily make up other connectives. Yeah? Um, so because we define the connectives by the introduction rule, does that mean that by just hook up any introduction rule to some imaginary connectives, you can always find the harmonious that it's able to work on this for us? Okay, no, you won't always be able to. So not arbitrary introduction rules uh, will give you good connectives. There will be some rules that you can make up that gives you things for which you cannot construct elimination rules. If that happens, it's infuriating, okay? <laughs> because you have in mind that there is some really cool computation. If you only had the right logic and the right judgment to do it, you would have this great system that everyone would want to use. And then you sit there for weeks and weeks and you can't figure out the right introduction elimination rule and it doesn't work, okay? So it's, a, it's an art to do these things, right? Conjunction is about the, the only, the most trivial example I could think of, right? As things get more complicated, well, they get more complicated and sometimes they fail. Yep? Did you get the same thing? Hmm? Did you get the same thing? Ah, okay. So, if you followed Bob's lecture, okay, which is a big if, okay. Um, okay, then he would say yes because he had these two conditions on pairs, which is related to conjunction, 
And one of them would say that these two things have to be equal. Okay? And another would say that these two things have to be equal. Okay? And Ed will explain it in a great amount of detail if you're unsure about it. So it will come up. Okay? So they should be equal. But only one of them has a computational meaning, as we'll see in the next lecture. This one is a kind of extensionality principle that you don't need to compute. But this reduction actually is the driving force behind computation. And essentially, if you think about the introduction rule, is that the introduction rule constructs you a pair, a pair of two proofs, one for A and one for B. And it, it constructs you a, a proof of A and B, which is going to be a pair. The first elimination rule is the first projection out of that pair. And the second elimination rule is the second projection out of the pair. And then the local reduction, this one says, if you take the first projection of a pair, you get the first component of that. Okay. So that's a driver of computation. And we'll see that in detail in the next lecture. Okay. These are really excellent questions, right? So if I was going to try something like that, I, I would have tried using two instead of one. Because it's going to be the difference No, there is no E. We're starting with only this. Only one proof of A and B. It's this one. Yeah, these are two completely, this is a really thick, thick, thick line here. <laughs> OK. So we're starting with this D, and we have to use it twice. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, since we're considering all these sort of possible inference rules in general, yeah. uh, I'm just wondering, um, and you're saying that it's not possible, it's not that for all inference rules we can generate these nice harmonious elimination rules. Right. Yeah, that's because. No, it's definitely not obvious, and it's a driver of research in this field. And if I could give you a short description of it, it would be a much less interesting field. Okay, there is no. I can tell you. Okay, the introduction rule, the elimination rules match. They're in harmony because they're locally sound and complete. And in lecture three, we see the global version of all of that. But I can't distill it to the essence, because I'm not sure that there is such a thing. I don't think we can break it down further than I already did. Yeah? So the, the projections expansion, what are they? Functions, or how do you define OK, so they're operations on proofs, right? Because we take one proof to another, OK? Um, and they're a witness to the fact that the elimination rules are sound and complete. So they're witnesses. OK. They're not proofs themselves. They're not themselves proofs. They're transformations on proofs. They go from one proof to another. This goes from, from this kind of a proof to that one. And this goes from any proof like that to proof like that. OK, because. The thing on the right-hand side must exist on the left-hand side, like it's there. Yeah? Or you must be able to construct it somehow okay, out of the pieces that you have. And similarly, here you have this, and you have to apply the elimination rules and then reconstitute by the introduction the conclusion. So you have to be able to construct the right-hand side from what you're given on the left-hand side. So in the expansion, you can use on the left OK? Yeah? So the, the Ds and the Es yeah. are syntactic. Um, they, they, are, they are, think of them as, as the text, of, a, a text of proof. It's consisting of the proof, and these, and these rules are ways to write more text. Is that? Well, they stand for proofs. And proofs can be written down as text, but proofs are abstract, more abstract mathematical objects, right? I can write them down, of course, but they're not equivalent to that text, right? So they stand, there are notations that stand, it, D stands for an arbitrary proof of A, and E stands for an arbitrary proof of B. So, so where I want to go with that is that the, the D on the, to the right of the thick one. Yeah.
Here? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is a is itself a proof of A. That's right. That's right. It, it's a proof of A. And, but it's not the same as D itself. I mean, is it no. Right. Okay. It applied one more inference to D to get A. Okay? So in this time relate back to the time ago. Okay. <laughs> and the, these proofs are in category theory. Are these um, reduction like two cells? Two Okay, so in category theory, there would be equations rather than reductions. Um, and uh, Ed will explain it. I will try not to explain category theory here um, because I'm totally unqualified to do so. But it is true that these things would be equations. Okay. And they would be justified, these equations would be justified by a categorical interpretation of what conjunction is. So you can look at it in the triangle, and it is the same. Okay. okay, so yeah, so I picked this example because it should be pretty clear, but things get more complicated quickly. Okay. Um, so now I'm going for, next thing I'm going for implication. I'm going to try to use when is A implies B true, right? And so that's a little bit tricky, so I'm actually going to take a little bit of a step back, and I'm going to give you something, I'm going to ask you what that is. Okay, so up. Okay. Um, A and B and C. True. I'm going to deduce by and elimination two. B and C is true. And I'm going to deduce by and elimination one that B is true. Okay, so I'll just leave that there as it stands. So what have I actually, what is this? Is that a proof? Well, if that's a proof, I've proved something arbitrary, B. Okay, great. Any formula is true. Our logic collapses to nothing, okay? It's a lemma, okay, we're getting there. Oh, it's not an implication. I don't use implies on bald or, 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 at all, right? There's no implied symbols. It's not an implication. It's an inference. And what does the inference do? It's not just one inference. It's two inferences, right? Yeah? It transforms evidence for A and B and C into evidence for B. Right. It's something that if you had a proof of A and B and C, then you could get out evidence for B, right? You could get a proof for B. OK? Okay, so that thing is a very, very important concept. So this is um, what we call, what I call a hypothetical proof. Okay, and the hypothetical proof says if you had that, then you would be able to get that. Okay, um, so what does a hypothetical proof actually establish? Uh, this is a hypothetical proof, but what do I get? What do I, what's my reward for doing a hypothetical proof? Now is where the idea lemma comes in, but yeah? Uh, not yet. I want to do this without implication. And the reason I want to do this without implication is that um, we want to first understand the judgmental constructions, which are very few of them, and then we want to derive what implication is from those constructions. So, but the answer is right, of course, but I'm going to postpone that a little bit. Yeah? Okay. Right. The hypothetical proof establishes a derived rule of inference A and B and C. I conclude B, right? I would be justified in using this derived rule of inference, right? Because I have a hypothetical proof of it. Yeah? Um, yeah, I don't want to focus on that at the moment, but you can also think that you're extracting a piece from a larger thing, which is also something that's being studied, but that's actually not inside my five lectures, okay? 
So one thing would be, we can call it the derived rule of inference. Okay. Another way to write it is what we call a hypothetical judgment, which Bob mentioned. Okay. So we can write it as, if I knew A and B and C was true, then I could derive that B is true. Okay. So that's called a hypothetical judgment. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, it's just a notation that says if you know the thing on the left, we're allowed to conclude the thing on the right. Okay? Yep? Uh, I'm trying to understand the difference between proof and inference. Okay. An inference is just a small part of the proof. It's one step. Multiple inference constitutes a proof. But you want to make sure that there aren't any assumptions that you have in the sort of uh, discharge at the top. So when we say a proof, we usually say something that's complete. Yeah? Uh, right, if I write D here, okay, well I mean that for any proof of that, I can get a proof of that. And sometimes using like dog mind with the hypotheticals, is that? Yeah, that's the equivalent, you just don't use a name. Okay, so let's see if we can leverage this notion of hypothetical proof, hypothetical judgment, with inference, if you will, to give meaning to implication. Okay. Uh, okay, let me do it over here. Because. Okay, so when should A implies B be true? Okay? My hint is on this board. Okay? When should A implies B be true? Yep? Right. So if, okay, B is true follows, I'm going to use that anonymous notation now, from the hypothesis that A is true. Okay? Now, I have to be extremely careful here. Okay? And the reason I have to be very careful is because I want to make sure that this hypothesis, A is true, is available only inside this proof. Right? I don't want to make it available outside. Um, because um, it's just there to be able to prove B not to prove, for example, I shouldn't be able to prove that. Well, let's come to this later. Okay. So the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to know this. I'm going to label this the implication introduction rule. I'm going to put uh, some kind of a variable there. Okay. Say let's call it x in this case, and I'm saying this is justified. Okay. X from this from this introduction rule. So I can use this assumption, but the scope of x is essentially this proof not outside the subproof. So I call this the scope of X. Scope of X. Okay. Okay, so I'm using the concept of hypothetical judgment to, to, um, um, to introduce an implication. Okay. So sometimes we call this, we internalize the notion of a hypothetical judgment as a proposition. So as a judgment, it is just something like that over there, or something like this over here. Um, but here, it actually becomes a proposition. Okay? And it's important for it to become a proposition, so I can nest it. I can say A implies B implies C implies D, and so on. I can put it arbitrarily deep in the formula. This thing is only something that I can do in proofs, sort of like at the top level. Okay? So now I can iterate, for example, implications once I've internalized it as a proposition. Does that make introduction rule make sense? Okay, so um, now we need to make the pragmatist happy. Okay, if I know that A implies B is true, how can we use that knowledge? Yeah? If you have an A, you can use B. Right, if you also have an A, then we conclude a B. 
and that's the implication elimination rule. Okay? All right, let's see if we can apply our tests to make sure that all of that works out. Actually, I'm put it, yeah, I'm going to put it here. Are these rules in harmony? Okay, so for a soundness, I have to check. If I introduce a connective and then I apply an arbitrary elimination, I don't get any information, right? Whatever I have is already justified. Okay, so let's do that. So I introduce A implies B, implication introduction, new hypothesis. Let's call this proof D here, which uses A, which is labeled X. And then I apply an elimination rule to that with A. Let's call this proof E. And I get B, and that's implication elimination. OK, if, is this the only case I have to check? I have to check every introduction followed by every possible elimination. We have only one introduction, one elimination. This is all I have to check, right? Can I find evidence for B? Okay, that doesn't use the implication from what I'm given here. How would I find the evidence? Yeah? Yeah, so we have a proof of B already, right? We have a proof of B here. So let's start with that. We have a proof B of B, which is called D, but it uses A, which was labeled X. But if you eliminate that introduction, right, our justification for x goes away, so we can't leave that there. This is not a valid proof, okay? That's just a hypothetical judgment. But now, how do I get a proof of b that doesn't use that extra assumption? So he said it, but I'm not sure everybody could hear it. Maybe somebody else. Yeah, we have a proof of, e, of a, which is e, so we'll just substitute um, that proof of e up here, okay? And we have to substitute in every place where x is being used in this proof of a. Right. Potentially in multiple places because an assumption can be used multiple times, as we've already seen. Okay? So the, if you want, hypothetical judgments are defined by substitution. You can substitute a proof for the unfilled leaves and you get a proof of the conclusion. And to be using that principle, this is a hypothetical judgment that means I can substitute an actual proof for the hypothesis and I get a proof of the conclusion. Okay, and so now on the right hand side, I'm no longer using implication. So it's okay, I have reduced, I haven't gained any information. Make sense? Okay, so in this proof here, D, I can use the assumption A, but only inside this part of the proof. And so X is just saying that I can use that, but only inside that subproof. So we're just labeling our assumptions, okay? Does the x on the right hand side as well have meaning? Or? No, because we have substituted away for it. So this is just a notation of E substitute of a uses of x in the proof D. So it goes away. When you substitute for a variable, the variable goes away. Yeah? Yes, yes. D is a hypothetical proof of B given A, yeah? So you, you have another notation for hypothetical proof, which is slightly B. Yeah. Um, if A dot 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 B, is that equivalent to A slightly B? Yes. <laughs> yes. So is there a computational interpretation of bar X being like lambda X? Yes. We'll see that tomorrow. But it's definitely true. Okay, so okay, so the okay, so there's sound, that's good. This will turn out to be beta reduction, right? Because the introduction rule is going to be a lambda abstraction, the elimination rule is going to be a function application, and then this is going to be essentially applying a function to its argument and doing beta reduction. Um, so but we also have a second test to perform. What's the second test? Completeness. What do I need to check for completeness? Okay, I have to start with an arbitrary proof of A implies B. And I have to show somehow 
um, that I can expand it into a proof. Okay, how do I how do I have to be able to expand it? Applying the elimination rules in such a way that I can reconstitute a proof of A implies B from the pieces. Okay, so how do I do that? How do I expand the proof of A implies B? Or our rule is wrong, yeah? We assume A, okay. By elimination rule, I get B, okay. Okay. Okay, so I prove A implies B. I assume A, call that X, so that's not really used outside, but I'm just using it inside here, and I use the proof of A implies B. Okay? So that's my local expansion. And that will correspond in the lambda calculus eventually to something called eta expansion. Okay? Okay. Everybody understand that little proof figure there? I'm sorry, I got a little lost. What, what is the I to protect? Okay. So this is an implication introduction. Okay. So an implication introduction always labels the hypothesis that it makes. So this introduction makes the hypothesis A labeled X. And I use it only in one place, right here. I use it in the second premise of the implication elimination rule. Make sense? Okay. Other questions on this? Okay, so if you buy that, then our rules are sound and complete, okay? And we have to find implications satisfactorily. But we needed the notion of hypothetical judgment. It wasn't very difficult to get because already we could write down these incomplete proofs. So it kind of comes from free just from the idea that we can chain together inference rules, okay? Questions? Yeah? Yeah. Um, it requires a hypothetical judgment on the, on the top. Right. right. So B is not a hypothetical judgment by itself. B true is not. B tr yeah. So it's not even worth like you evaluate. How do you evaluate that on that? Um, B is not a hypothetical judgment. Like the way we define induction. You mean here? Or where? This one? Yeah. So you have B over um, right. A minus B. Right. So there's a hypothetical judgment here because we're deducing B from A uh, right. using this proof as a. The top thing is like this thing here, right, okay. is a hypothetical proof of B from A. Okay. okay. All right. Okay, so you can look at it either way. I would say this way. We're given a proof of A implies B, and given that proof, we construct another proof of A implies B. But if you think of it as something that's open, you haven't filled it in, then it would be hypothetical. So you can look at it either way, whatever turns out to be convenient in the context that you're in. Okay? All right, so let's see. We have 20 minutes. Um, okay, let me complete the connectives for you because um, some of the connectives are a little bit, uh, require some thought. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, okay, so here we already defined the OR rule. Hopefully this will OR, first OR introduction rule, second OR introduction rule. Okay, so I defined disjunction by saying you can deduce A or B if A is true, and you can deduce A or B if B is true. Okay, so it's unusual because previously we defined all the connectives, which is only implies an end, by just one rule each, okay? Okay, so now we need to figure out for the pragmatist, basically, how do we use A or B? 
So what's the elimination form for A or B? Okay. So I'm going to give you a wrong one, and then we'll try to figure out what's actually wrong with it. Well, if A or B is true, then A must be true. Ouch. Okay. This is obviously wrong. Okay. But how do we figure out that it's wrong? Some of our tests have to fail, yeah? A or B, you know. Uh, yeah, but how? I don't want to give an example. I want to, well, maybe you could, but I want our tests to fail, right? Yeah. It should be not sound or not complete. Which one do you suspect? Not sound. Not sound, not sound right? And then by this very questionable rule, we get A. And if you have some justification for B, there's nothing we can do to construct a proof of A. Right? So it's not sound. OK, good. So at least our tests failed that thing, which is good. All right, that's good from one perspective. But in another one, we still have to find, if you know A or B is true, how do we use that? Yeah? OK, so what we can do is we can say, OK, um, if we can prove C from A, OK, so there's something here. Let's label this x. And there's another proof that goes from C true, from B true to C. Let's call this y. Then we have or elimination. It introduces both x and y. OK, then we're allowed to conclude C is true. So this is what's usually in mathematics called proof by cases. If you know that A or B is true, we reason, and we're trying to prove something overall, we introduce two cases. In one case, we assume A, and we must be able to show C in that case. Then we assume B in the other case, and we still must be able to show C. Then we're OK, because in both cases, C follows. Okay. So rules get more complicated, and there's two hypothetical judgments involved. right? One, a proof of C given A, and another one, a proof of C given B. Okay, everybody can see that. So if I put the x and y on the on the or elimination, it's a little bit sloppy, right? Because you have x only here and y only here, right? It's not like you have you can use x in this proof and y in this proof. X only here and y only there. Okay, everybody on board? Okay, good. So now we need to show that these are sound and complete. Okay, let's just show the uh, soundness. Okay, so the soundness is well, what do we need to check? We don't get anything new by using an arbitrary introduction. So let's start with um, this one. We have A, we get A or B, followed by an elimination. Um, so we get some C by going uh, A, X, let's call this E. And we get C, and we get B, Y. We have F here, and we get C in this or elimination using X and Y. And this is the first or introduction. OK. How can we reduce that one? So what we're looking for is evidence for C that doesn't actually use the or, right? Yeah? Right, we can get from A with E to C, okay, but because that's given to us here. And then here we have a proof of A, so we can substitute that for uses of X. So we need substitution again, not surprising because here we have two hypothetical judgments. Now, if this turned out to be the second OR introduction, what would we do? If this goes for, hmm? Yeah, so we substitute the proof of B that we would have here for uses of B in, in this proof F. Right? So no matter how we apply the introduction rule, there's only one elimination rule, but we can find direct evidence for C by using the substitution for our hypothetical proofs. Everybody okay? 
All right, so um, uh, let's see. There's a couple of other connectors, but let me skip them because I want to spend five minutes um, sort of uh, talking about what you might do as a homework, okay? Um, so the things that are missing here, by the way, are falsehood and truth, okay? And they're interesting, but not as interesting as the homework you have to do. Okay, so. Okay, so there's two different kinds of questions I ask you to do. The first one is just to practice using the rules to actually proving something interesting, okay? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose various distributivity laws, and you'll have to figure out whether they are true or not. If they are true, then you should be able to find a proof. So what is a distributivity law? Okay, so for example, first one would be A or B and C. Okay, so now from that we can prove in that direction, we can also prove in that direction, okay, A or B and A or C. Did I write this correctly? I think so. This was one of the things that Bob wrote down as an axiom for lattices, right? And here it's something we have to prove, right? Because nobody gives us any lattice axioms. But if we did our rules right, then these things should be true. Okay, are we clear on that? Okay. Now the second one, it's a little bit more weird. Okay, A implies B implies C. Okay, would be equivalent to A implies B implies that A implies C. <laughs> question mark. I mean, these are all question marks, right? I mean, I gave it away that these things are true, but this thing we have to check. So can implication distribute over implication in that way? Okay. And the third one is, can we distribute implication over distribution? A implies B or C. Okay, which thing, what could we write here? Um, any suggestion what we would write on the right-hand side? Yeah, so A implies B and a implies C, question mark. Okay. Um, okay, now you want to check these, and there are six different exercises really here. Check. If you had this assumption, could we prove that? If you have that assumption, can we prove that? And so on. Right? So which of these are true? Okay, so that's the uh, first exercise. Now the second exercise is to apply not particular reasoning about truth, but actually write down the rules for on this judgment. So instead of saying A true, I say A true at time T. So I'm going to write, for that I would write A at T. Right? And the interesting thing is that I can also say, so let's say I want propositions, implication, conjunction, disjunction. And I'll give you one more to make it interesting next. Okay? And the idea is that next A should be true at time t, somehow, if and only if. Okay, I'll put quotes here because you have to figure out how to do that. If A is true at time t plus 1. Okay? So let's assume we have a time zero and we have a way to increment time to time t plus one. So it's discrete time temporal logic, right? But we can increase the time. We have only one very simple temporal operator, namely the circle of A. Okay? So now you can take this as far as you want. Of course, you should write down the rules, the introduction elimination rules, and you should check that they're sound incomplete. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that no. No. yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, no, it could be or. Um, so does it, what does it change if it's an or? OK, so really, the, it's a two-part question. First part of the question is fill in the right-hand side. <laughs> the second part of the question is to try to prove whether that's true or not. Hmm? Well, yeah, we don't want to solve the homework now. OK. Well, they're all interesting, OK? Because they might all be true or false. So, and, um, OK, let me say, restate the second exercise. So we had done this in intuitionistic logic. Now I want you to do temporal logic. What is temporal logic? Temporal logic is defined by a very simple change in perspective. Um, the change in perspective is just saying that instead of saying A is true, we say A is true at time t, and we'll write it like this as a judgment. Okay. Now you can't say something like, it's, you're not allowed to say A at t implies A at t plus 1. Why are you not allowed to say that? Because this would be a proposition, but this is just a judgment. Okay. OK, so I'm going to give away one of the rules. Just OK, I could say if I have A at T and I have B at T, then I'm allowed to conclude A and B hold at time T. And that would be the deduction rule. So I'm going to give away one of the rules. OK, so you all have these judgments. And now the question is, what is a, how do we internalize that in the logic, right, this judgment of time? Well, I'm going to do it a very, very simple way. I'm going to not do you arbitrary temporal logic. I want you to just define a circle operator, which means A is true at time, a circle A is true at time t if A is true at time t plus 1. That's my only reflection of time. So time is only, I have a time 0 if you want, and I have a way to take time t plus 1, t plus 2, t plus 3, and so on. So for example, the following should be true in your logic. Or let, let's, let's actually check this out. So if I have at the next time A implies B, and I have at the next time A, what should I be able to conclude? I should be able to get B at the next time, right? Because this means A implies B is true at time t plus 1, then A is true at time t plus 1, and then and this should be true for at which time points? Any, right? OK, now on the other hand, you shouldn't be able to prove that. Circle A implies B implies that A implies circle B. OK, it doesn't matter what time you're at, you should not be able to prove that, right? That would be bad because we don't actually know A is true only at the current time, but it may not be true at time t plus 1. You should not be able to prove that. OK? Does that assignment make sense? OK, so, uh, right, so this one should check out somehow in your logic, and this one should fail. You should not be able to prove this. Now, one thing I should m mention, there are some things in these here, and even some things here you should not be able to prove. But I haven't given you the means of actually proving that you can't prove it. Right? So in other words, it will not be until lecture three that I give you the tools to show that, oh, we can't prove this in temporal logic. Right now, you can only try to construct a proof and it'll fail somehow, right? Or when you try one of these distributivity laws, you'll get to a situation where you think one direction doesn't hold. And it doesn't hold because you can't prove it, but you can't prove that you can't prove it. When in lecture three, after lecture three, you'll actually be able to prove that you can't prove those things. So in other words, they're really not universally true. Okay. Um, so for now, you just have to try your best in trying to prove these things. And if you fail to prove them, well, you know, then um, you think, oh, that probably shouldn't be true. But you don't have any means of formally proving that. Okay. Um, so part of the reason I'm doing it this way is that you experience what it, what it means. Ah, I can't prove that, but I'm not sure if it's really true or not. Okay. And I'm asking you to do this because it's interesting to figure out, well, how to design a logic. And actually, uh, an interesting logic, even though I'm withholding the information on what it actually means. 
okay, computationally. For those of you who know, please don't tell everybody else, okay. All right? Okay, so next, in the next lecture, we'll start actual programming.